up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. We were horror struck smile, because we had been brought up with no history bag, as per the book. Boys, that's the and that history came from the top What's down. The and it was glory. It and it was sacrifice. Was and it was heroism. So and the bravery. What was never told was the real story of those that actually fought it. And that was our brief. That history, not from the shiny boots down, but from the men in the mud up. Charles Chilton was a BBC producer into music and he'd lost his father in the First World War. It was in 1958, he was on holiday, Arras, the battlefield, and he looked for his father's grave. When I last discovered my father's official memorial, it was to find that he had no known grave. What could have possibly happened to a man that rendered his burial impossible? What horror could have taken place that rendered the burial of 35,942 men impossible and all in one relatively small area. And so out of that experience he formulated a programme of the First World War songs. That was broadcast and Jerry Raffles, who was the general manager here and also Joan's partner, heard that radio programme and thought, that could be a good stage show. You know, I'm often asked why we were all clowns, seaside clowns. Well, when you read Joan's book, she had been taken as a young girl to the seaside and she'd seen the Pierrots on the beach. And she comments how she loved that, uh, dressed all in that shiny satin. She didn't like death on stage. And she had a horror of khaki and uniforms. We realised that we were actors playing clowns, playing soldiers. So that the horror was thrice removed. I mean, our rifles were wooden because Pierrot's wouldn't have had real rifles. We used walking sticks. Joan didn't like sentimentality on stage. The songs are a counterpoint to the horror. When the horror got too much, she'd then get them to burst into the song. And although the songs were traditional, the soldiers made up their own words, and it was those that we used. Hush, here comes a we rehearsed those scenes, but we never knew until almost oh, the last few days that there was going to be this thing called a ticker tape. We certainly didn't know that there were going to be slides. You see, the ticker tape was almost the antithesis of what we were doing as performers. There are lots of songs, there are lots of jokes, it's all done jokingly, and, and it, it brings the audience in, and then the punch comes at the end of the first day. And then from then on, there's horror. And then that ticker tape would go across saying, yes, it was the first battle. Um, and 500,000 men died. So the ticker tape reflected the truism that wasn't being brought over in the history or what was happening in front of them on stage. I want to go home. Nobody ever spoke about it. It wasn't fun. And we considered that it was this terrible thing about bravery and that men didn't cry, and that men didn't object, and that you were a hero, and they died heroes. Nobody talked about men screaming for their mothers going over the top. 
which of course we read about from the papers that were kept secret. But they did, screamed for their mothers. And a woman came in to Joan and she said, I've tried to get my old man to come and talk to you because he was, he was there. And Joan said, oh, no, no, no. She said, no, he won't come, he won't come. He won't talk about it. And well, that's what we all were, Canon Fuzzle. Haig lining that at Somme, 1,000 men in one single line, in full pack, with the order they did not run, they did not try and hide. They just marched toward the enemy. And the Germans were waiting for them, and they just machine gunned them all down. When they got to the barbed wire, the British barbed wire, they just machine gunned them down and they all fell dead or wounded on the barbed wire. And the next day he ordered another thousand to do exactly the same. And they were mowed down and they marched forward and those still not dead on that barbed wire screamed at them to go back. Go back! But no, they had been ordered three days, 3,000 men. The arm scene, which opens Act Two, where, where we're all being armament manufacturers, you know, and it's that lovely, lovely face where the gamekeeper says to one of them, oh, I hear it'll be over by Christmas, sir. And one of them says, oh, I hope not because they were making millions, they're still making millions. The armaments, we live on armaments. But it was always the same with Joan. Somebody wrote a script, but then the company worked on it. And so there was an enormous amount of, of, of homework by everybody. And, and Joan would pick on the first attack on the Somme. Arras, gas. A different subject and you'd all go away that night and you'd all read up and then the next morning you'd all gather and from all your homework and study you came out with what you considered the salient points of, of whatever and then out of that she would improvise one of the unique workings of the theatre workshop and Joan's way of working was that in rehearsal, you all played each other's roles. Now, lots of actors would object to that, somebody else playing. Um, but for an actor, it was very good because another person with a different thought hit on a different reason or... And, and so you took that as your own and used it. You very often, um, in a love scene, you... The man played the woman, the woman played the man. Very interesting how that change of gender brought up different attitudes. She did that a lot. Now, Joan loved two or three conversations going on at once. She always used to say, we all listen to two or three conversations going on at once. You never get that on stage. Somebody talks and everybody else listens. It doesn't happen in real life. And so she loved it when she had three conversations going on, but that then you had to work it on different levels, almost like a Mozartian symphony. And so that the pertinent line came out and the audience heard it, while there's a lot of other conversations going on, but you could still hear. It took hours. And then people used to say, of course, you, uh, at the Yeti Workshop, you make it up as you go along, don't you? <laughs> Sometimes, but not always. Yes, that, that took an awful lot, a great deal of, uh, of work, but worth it because you, you, did, you did get all those conversations and all that information came across all in one block. There was a great influence from Brecht. 
But then Jonas would say, you stole from the best. Now, <laughs> more than Mr. Brecht, Herr Brecht, um, you had the Marx Brothers. You see, we were always playing the Marx Brothers. We were always playing Charlie Chaplin. You would always play musical. You'd do it in double time, like silent films. If you, if you, if you got sort of bogged down with detail or something, she'd suddenly say, come on, get on the piano and, and let's do silent films. And, and you'd go diddly dum, diddly dum. And, and you'd do it all in that double time, which took the pressure off you as an actor, but then brought out the, the salient point of, 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 of what the scene was about. And then you'd go back with a different perspective. Because there was no money, imagination had to come into play. You had to think of another way around. Hadn't got the money to spend on some ginormous set. Um, and all the better for it those sets were. Now you very often see no set at all. Well, that was, that was lovely war. There was no set. It was an empty stage. It had two bal balcons either side of the stage. And that was it. And further back, there was a, there was a, a gantry with, with the ticker tape on. And otherwise, it was the best. You created everything. But that was Joan's way of working. Came into a crowded room, and the crowded room was empty. You had to make it crowded. It had a major impact on the direction of theatre in this country. They're brought up with horror on their television screens. We see people burning, we see people being shocked. And, and you know, and, and will it dull the senses? Will they accept that? But of course, it, it's strange. It, it's the show itself. Somehow that ticker tape, those numbers, always got through to people. And especially when it said, gains five yards or gains nil and when you just had the ticker tape saying 20,000 men had died for what? Nothing. So it got through. I, I, that pleased me enormously that the younger generation was still being moved. I came up here and said well done Joan. Still getting, still getting the message across. And it's making straight for you. And you'll see all the wonders of no man's land. If a whiz bang hits you.